Good evening. Please take your seat. We're starting. Some time ago, I attended the presentation of a book. The author of this book at one point said this, let's think about St. Francis of Assisi, a man that after 800 years still talks to us. I was struck by this. Uh, let's think about all of this time, all the generations, the history that have been touched and attracted by this way of speaking. How is it possible that still today, after 800 years, eight centuries, we still hear the voice of a man that lived such a long time ago? One of the possible answers is that we hear him because the custody of the Holy Land exists. And today we have the custodian, Father Francesco Patton. Please welcome him. Welcome him with friendship and with affection affection we feel for this reality. This affection and this friendship, uh, uh, thanks to this, I visited uh, Father Francesco about a year ago. And I was quite annoyed because uh, after all the mails, just think about a person that was in Jerusalem and had to manage all the problems, all the friars, and also um, meet me, uh, a person that just wanted to tell him about the history of friendship that has linked uh, the meeting to the friars of the Holy Land for a very long time. We're talking about friendship, about affection, the will to learn. This affection is testified also by the fact that on the door of the Museum of the Holy Land, there's a label. One on this label, you can read the name of Father Luigi Giussani, and this shows how deep our friendship is. I visited him in July, and uh, I talked to him about the meeting, and here we are. The exhibition is very successful. There, it is uh, very crowded, and there are huge queues. And today we have the opportunity to talk with him. He will talk about the custody, the work uh, the friars carry out in the Holy Land. And uh, he will talk to us about these 800 years. So we'll talk about why we chose the title 800 years in the Holy Land, a living legacy. We'll also try to understand the meaning of the quote I talked about before. And about St. Francis that still talks to us after eight centuries. I would like to give the floor to Father Francesco now. He was born in 1963. And starting from May of last year, he works as the custodian of the Holy Land, and this will be his occupation for the next five years, so six years in total.
So very briefly, in the Holy Land, the custodian is seen as one of the main religious authorities. He's in charge of the status quo, which is a series of habits that regulate the life, uh, life of sanctuaries. For example, the ones of the Church of the Nativity and the Holy Sepulchre. Father Francesco will talk to us about the custody and this voice that's talked to us after eight centuries. And welcome again. Grazie mille, è stato Thank you very much. You mentioned St. Francis. I would like to say what he always said. May the Lord give you peace. I think we all need peace. And only the Lord can give peace to us. It is an honor for us to be here at the meeting and being here with this exhibition that through images evokes the memory of the Holy Land, the memory of 800 years of Fran uh, Franciscan presence in the Holy Land and makes us also accountable for the present. We have to realize that the memory of the past is not enough. We cannot only remember the greatness of our ancestors, but we also have to take upon our responsibilities. And offer the future generations a different future. And build a better future. Every generation has to do this. The exhibition is full of pictures and images that are all about our presence in the Holy Land. I would like to focus on two aspects during my speech. And then we'll listen to your questions. The first aspect is memory, and the second is gaining memory back, which is the main theme of this meeting, or that you have bequeathed by your father, earn it in order to possess it. When we talk about holy land and about custody, we talk about the memories of the places and the memory in these places. We have been in the Holy Land for eight centuries and everything has to do with memory. These places bear the memory of incarnation, of salvation, which is in every stone that we keep. There's also the memory of a lot of changes that have happened during the centuries. The memory of a Christian identity that lives together with a Jew and Muslim presence. There's the memory of the local Christians, the ones we call the living stones of the Holy Land. which are sign of the first Christian communities. Every generation that has lived in the Holy Land, every generation of Franciscans and Christians has to earn uh, back what they have uh, bequeathed.
Now I'll talk about our mission that was given to us by Providence. In these places, there's also the memory, a Franciscan memory, and the memory of uh, an encounter. The first friars came to the Holy Land in 1217, led by Father Elia from Cortona. They arrived there after Pentecost with the dream of spreading the gospel and giving their own life for Christ. In 1219, Francis of Assisi arrived to the Holy Land during the Fifth Crusade. And then he went to Egypt. And there, a very famous encounter took place in Amietta, an encounter between a sultan and Francis of Assisi. Francis decided to go towards uh, the place where Muslims were, even risking his own life. And he met with the Sultan to talk to him about Jesus Christ. Francis managed to create a dialogue, to cross the lines back, and then to visit all the places that were very important to him. He walked on the land where Jesus and the Virgin Mary walked. A Franciscan life means walking on Jesus' path. Just think of what he must have felt by walking in the land where Jesus was born, where he had lived, where he had died for us. St. Francis loved the humble God, the God that was born in Bethlehem. He visited the manger where Jesus was born. Saint Francis is the man of is a man of service. He visited the cenacle and there he saw the place where Jesus taught us the importance of washing each other each other's feet where he gave his own uh, spirit his own life for us Francis loved the crucifix and he went on the calvary he prayed there And there he said, we adore you, Jesus Christ, and we thank you because you saved the world. He visited the sepulcher, a place where the body of our Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ lied. This was extremely important for St. Francis, and this tra transformed him. Lascerà a noi frati un carico. From 1220 to today, he will leave us a new indication, a new method of how we should live the missionary dimension of our of our mission. In other words, going towards other people not only going against people, but sharing with people. It's a chapter in which he tells us that we can announce the gospel, that we shouldn't fight, that we are a creature, that we are creatures of God, and that we should go 
without any sort of polemical attitude and to serve others out of love for God and also with a clear identity because without a clear identity it's difficult to authentically encounter others and then naturally he will add the friars will be able to explicitly announce Christ and they will have to remember that they already gave their life to Christ uh, accepting a possible martyrdom. We have been guided in the last eight centuries and along these lines our s our lifestyle, our way of be staying in the Holy Land was formed. What kind of ways of service we have have been cleared over time and our Christian identity has been uh, developed and clarified. And at the same time, if we are there, if we find ourselves there, it's because we have been given a special and a special mandate by the church. Uh, Pope Clement the Sixth uh, issued a papal bull in which he he bequeaths to the Franciscans of the time in twelve mm, thirteen forty two. He gives them uh, sanctuaries in which to uh, offer uh, liturgical celebrations and to praise God. Then a care of these sanctuaries will lead to opening uh, the opening of these sanctuaries to common people. If at the beginning the friars uh, were, a very s were of a very small number and counted only a handful of sanctuaries, because the uh, Senecal tomb of the Virgin Mary and the Church of the Nativity came about in 14th century. Now we count uh, more than uh, 170 uh, uh, friars with f from 42 different nations and many more san sanctuaries in which we not only live but we will die. We live in these sanctuaries. We not only uh, celebrate liturgy there but we also live in these sanctuaries. And those who have seen the exhibition will see how it is important for us to stay in the sanctuaries. And here I uh, explain the, di the difference between the passage from memory to legacy. How can we stay in these places? How can we stay in these sanctuaries and make sure that they are places that are alive. We are friars that live and we pray inside of these places. And it's, we host, we welcome anyone who wants to come and see them, to see these places. We host them within these places, be they pilgrims or others. For us, it is important to help people and to enter into the spirit of the place and not to treat them like we are tourists. It is important that who, who arrives feels like they are being hosted as Nazarenes because God did this. God Elimin eliminated the barrier between between men. It is also important that those who arrive also have 
the disposition of Mary. That, in other words, she gave the possibility to God himself to become man and encounter, be able to encounter us and mark history. So if we use Goethe's language, we earn our history insofar as we live what we have earned, what we have been bequeathed. In Nazareth, we earn the sanctuary only if we stay within it with a, a gaze of love and openness. In Bethlehem, the same thing. We can earn the place of Bethlehem, staying in Bethlehem with the gaze of Mary, with the gaze of the, of the three wise men. And in this way, we earn these sanctuaries that are situated around the Lake of Gal Galilee. If we are open and we let ourselves uh, be, uh, we let ourselves um, enter in a dialogue with our history. If we let ourselves be uh, consumed in the question, if we um, feel like ours, the question that uh, Jesus refers to Peter, do you love me, Peter? The Son of God, uh, we understand the true meaning of these places if we understand that in those places our history was changed because that is where evil was won that is where christ resurrected and entering this place i realize that my christian faith is based on something concrete and i realize that my life has been carried by god and life is greater than death. If we do this kind of path, this kind of journey, memory does not, is not bound to be arid, but becomes a memory that can nurture our faith and our uh, ability to, to uh, our efforts within that place, our missionary efforts. The service, this service characterized our missionary work. The parishes of the Franciscan experience are alive and have generated schools from uh, halfway through the 16th century until now. They are a great opportunity to, uh, for education and for helping to build together a uh, prospect of peace a within a place in which Christians and Muslims are not together. In one of our uh, schools, we have a very beautiful um, reality of teachers and students that are uh, that belong to the three uh, religions of Abraham: Muslims, Christians, and Jews. We have a great prospect for the future, and many other services that are linked to uh, promotion and development, individual and promotion, individual development, and uh, aiding local communities uh, help uh, with the construction of homes, new homes, to those who are in 
economic uh, strug struggling economically and the services of a cultural nature that are our research uh, institutions. Let us think, for example, of the archaeological sites that during the 20th century became very important. Out of love for those places, archaeologists started to study it. And this is why the, uh, we have a very uh, lively biblical sciences and archaeological uh, department. Many of the Catholics who arrive in Israel and in, from other countries collaborate in, this, uh, in these enterprises, in, this promotional, in these promotional initiatives many other services that are linked to the needs and concrete necessities of individuals and especially poor people. All of this does not, is not born from a philanthropic uh, approach, but by a method given to us by St. Francis to put ourselves uh, to serve God by serving the place we were we have been put in 800 years of being in the holy land was also made possible because of this uh, our style our uh, way of with dialogue our dialogue in the place and this it was emblematic. The episode of Sul the Sultan and St. Francis is emblematic, especially St. Francis' openness and disposition in front of the su Sultan. We are all sons and daughters of the same Holy Father. We, s we know that Jesus Christ gave his life for everyone, that the Holy Spirit blows w where it wants, that This dialogue is part of our history and it must be put into action today, not, not by people who try to make a group and to be exclusive, but who accept what's outside and transform the diversity into opportunities for dialogue. This dialogue is not always easy. These eight centuries of history, the martyrdom of the custody of the Holy Land was enriched by more than 200 friars who died either out of charity So, also within dialogue, risks are present. We don't search for dialogue because we are, we sustain a, a facile way of approaching others, but we have a dialogue because this is the method that was practiced by St. Francis himself that I think is the only antidote to conflicts between civilizations because with conflict only the logic of power prevails. Pope Francis in fact is inviting all of us in all in various ways to practice dialogue, to put dialogue into action. It, it may seem like a naive solution, but in fact it is without dialogue. Because on a political level, 
this can be confused. Without this dialogue, which allows us to uh, understand each other, it becomes, it is impossible for us to live together. So I would like to conclude my intervention with an invitation and with uh, a wish. The invitation is for you to come as pilgrims to the Holy Land so that you can also experience what we experience there and share with you uh, the experience of earning uh, as pilgrims what those places uh, are about. Ho the Holy Land is fascinating and it is also a welcoming land. There is no need to fear. And pilgrims come also certain of the protection of God. The pilgrims, pilgrimages, becomes a way for the Christians of the Holy Land to, be, to feel part of a universal church, that we are all part of this same body. And this becomes an important support for the life and for the, let's say, economy of the local church. And I also express a wish. My wish is that each one of us may feel provoked by personal choices in the future by the encounter with the saint who the, the one who made that holy land holy by his incarnation passion and resurrection in that land I wish that everyone be provoked to follow his traces because as St. John says believing in him we we can believe in his name First of all, I would like to ask you, Father Francesco, what was your first impression when you went to the Holy Land? When you went uh, in that land? Well, I had already been there in 97. I went there as a pilgrim in spring before Easter and I had been fascinated by the Holy Sepulchre and the Mount Tabor. When I went back there 20 years later as a custodian, my first impression was a mixture of feelings. Thanks to my new role, I understood the complexity of this land but at the same time, I also realized the deep fascination of this land. And what feeling prevails now? Complexity, fascination, is it still a mixture? Usually when people visit the Holy Land, they usually see a suffering world. They see harshness, tensions. How do you behave in this environment? When I first visited the Holy Land 20 years ago, I only visited 
uh, part of this land. But then, as a custodian, I had the opportunity to discover the custody of the Holy Land and its complexity, which is located in Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Cyprus, Rhodes, Egypt, and many other countries. It is an extremely complex world. The friars of the custody have to learn to live in this complexity, have to learn to love this complexity. What I believe is that we should avoid simplifying and we should learn to love complex realities with their complexity. Otherwise, we may start thinking things that are not actually true. And how can you face this complexity? This is not something you learn in books. I would like you to help us understand how can you do this. Living complexity, understanding complexity day by day means using every occasion to live with the local Christian community to help them in their concrete necessities. For example, helping them with their, with their parishes, with finding a home, with creating jobs, and so on. This means using every occasion, using dialogue, using a ecumenical and interfaith dialogue. It's a place where many parties are involved, many people are involved, and they have to learn to live together. I have mentioned the status quo. This means that when we have to carry out our work at the Holy Sepulchre. First, we have to find an agreement, an agreement with the Orthodox and Armenian communities. This is what I mean by day-by-day -by -day complexity. I cannot be harsh. I have to find a compromise. And this can be done. we can find an agreement, we can work together and live like brothers and sisters. There are currently interfaith dialogues going on with uh, the Muslim world going on. In Bethany, I took part in an initiative with Muslims. After the sunset, there was a dinner, and then after a few days, there was a meeting where both Jews and Christians spoke about John the Baptist. Recently, we have been invited to a round table with a representative of uh, the Jew world, uh, representatives from the Christian and Muslim world. We learn to live in this complexity is important for everyone that lives in the Holy Land Another very, a very important Christian figure of the Holy Land told me, there's too much religion in this, in this land. This is quite 
a pessimistic point of view. And it is also something that we are always struck by. It is not tension between religions. I don't believe that there's too much religion in that place. I believe in an encounter between religions. All religions have to make an effort and see their identity more openly and be open towards the others. If we're not afraid of one another because of our identity, then we have the opportunity to encounter everyone. There are a lot of opportunities to do this in the Holy Land, whereas in Europe there are not. Earlier on, you spoke about living stones of Christians, living Christians in these lands. And naturally, the gaze of the Holy Land is very broad. The many countries uh, invo that compose the Holy Land are much more. In the last couple of years, we have followed the tragedy of Syria. What, what does Syria bring today to us? Effectively, what happened in Syria is a tragedy. Their friars of the custody of the Holy Land in Syria are present um, in Aleppo and other cities that, of course, remained there in order to remain close to the Christian local communities, which in these years are communities which have been very much reduced. The Syrian church has really undergone a true tragedy in the last years. We also admit that Syria is also the second cradle of Christianity. The missionary dimension began thanks to the, the, the Syrian community in Antioch, in Antioch. Now, unfortunately, the Christian community has been seriously diminished. Before the war, there were 300,000 Christians. Now there are, is a tenth, 30,000. The population has been halved, and the Christians have been reduced to a tenth of their number. Many of them have died, others have gone, have emigrated and won't return. What our friars of the custody of the Holy Land have tried to do is to, in a simple manner, to help and sustain, support, and cultivate hope. The leader of Aleppo said that now there is some sign of hope in the sense that some Christian families are coming back to Aleppo. There is some sign of hope because uh, uh, around 60 couples have decided to uh, settle down and have families and so are looking towards the future. And clearly, the custody, but the whole church is trying to accompany and s support those who have been, th those who are left. But 
the word tragedy explains very well what happened in Syria to the Christians, which is not yet over. This should make us think of the future of Christians in the Holy Land as as coming towards its final phases in certain countries the custodies that you have will remain but the destiny of our Christian brothers is threatened how do you see it He who knows the future is only God. Only God knows what will happen in the future, and nobody can substitute him. There is a Psalm, this Psalm 89. We have an experience of time that has been signed, by, that is marked by the briefness of our own lives. It is impossible for us to see history in a on the long term. But I continue to trust that it is he who is leading history, that is guiding history. And the Christian presence is diminishing in these places, but I know that in other places it is instead increasing in the Middle East, for example, Christian Christianity had completely disappeared from Saudi Arabia. And now it counts around one million members. We really don't know how God leads history and how long it will take for some processes to uh, be to uh, come to completion. But as believers, we are called to witness, in any case, a trust and a hope that are greater than certain uh, evidences which are present, current evidences. This is my last question. I would like to go back to the meaning of custody. The meaning of custody. Does this mean something that is still static, that is, and that you have to continue to protect and support and protect from contamination, from uh, decay. What is custody in comparison to creation? Verbs are always important. We must pay attention. Creation is a verb that only pertains to God. We are never creative. We are maybe at most inventive. The verb to be a custodian, it is God who is our custodian. Our being custodians, our custody, is collaboration with God. And in the specific case of the places that we custody, the sense, the meaning of custody is to maintain the memory of these places alive. And at the same time, it is to continue to keep these places alive as places of experience to protect these places as if they were 
as if they were museums would not make sense. It, this would be false. We don't want that the sanctuaries become museums. The sanctuaries have to be places of dialogue and encounter so that whoever passes by these places can have a special encounter that maybe can transform uh, their life. Thank you. I am very struck by this uh, by this verb collaboration and and custody it strikes me because it also gives us the possibility in our in our matters to collaborate and protect what we have been given custody is actually a word that appears in the first pages of the Bible. I remember what uh, what Cain responds to God, am I the custodian of my brother? Am I the protector of my brother? If we don't protect people m before protecting places, we risk becoming like Cain. I underline something that you said, which I think is essential to understand all the tension around the current work you are doing. Pastoral service in parishes, but all the social activities and initiatives and educational initiatives, I, what strikes me is that they're always for everyone. They are thought for everyone, designed for everyone. And there is no kind of discrimination. This is very important to understand the logic with which this can be the, the method that St. Francis entrusted to us, that can become a method for us as well. Thank you very much for being here with us. We were very happy to have you. And we have a desire of collaboration and to continue with the meeting to begin another project. This exhibition can help us to understand the presence of the custody I invite you to buy the beautiful catalogue as well of the exhibition. I wish you a good first day of the meeting and I wish that you live it with as much intensity as we heard Paton explain of the 800 years in the Holy Land.